dressing well. <clears throat> that is awesome. Do you understand that does not happen a lot of places? It just doesn't. And I, but I notice things. For instance, your worship leader is not a bass. Definitely a tenor. Two things that helped me know that. Number one, where he started the doxology. Nice and high where I like it. Okay, so I love that. Thank you very much for taking care of me as a fellow tenor. I appreciate that. The other thing was on that last song, okay, one of the greatest songs written of, of the last century in, in church music, okay? Darlene Check wrote that phenomenal song. Wrote, tons of people impacted by that song. Every time I was supposed to lead worship and people would want me to do that song, I was like, nope, don't want to do it. Oh, but it's so great. It's awesome. Yeah, but it's so low. It hurts my voice to sing it. But he's so intelligent, he just took the part that goes low, he took it up. So I am impressed right now. I am sincerely impressed uh, with that. How awesome to be able to lead people in worship. So, uh, so here's a couple things that I, I want to share with you all today. First of all, keep singing. Uh, if you came in today and you sang just a little bit more robustly, because it's just been so long, people like, we go, oh yeah, they belong in that category or they belong in this category. Well, I want you to know, as a pastor of a fellow church in your association, that we are thrilled that you have chosen wisely by calling Mike Young to be your next pastor. That is an awesome, awesome thing. Uh, I've had the opportunity to interact with Mike uh, specifically and personally through his work out at Streeter. Um, I have seen his heart. Now, people all across our state will talk about the incredible work that he's done there. And those of you that have been out there, you've seen that, right? I mean, it looks totally different. It does all that. Now, that impresses me because I don't even know which end of a hammer is up, okay? I mean, literally, like I am the least handy person in the world. But that is not what impressed me about Mike Young when I worked with him at the camp. I had the opportunity to lead multiple different camps for, for IBSA. And what impressed me about Mike was not the work that he did, but the heart that he had for people that would come to know Christ or grow deeper in their relationship because of the work that was going on there. And, uh, and what was cool is that even at times that we wouldn't agree about stuff, like I wanted to go tear things up and he wouldn't let me do that because it was his job to protect things while I've got teenagers running around the camp or whatever, there was never a question about the heart. And that is so awesome because you have that heart now working to help lead your church to reach out to this community and beyond and his family. Even though they're now connected with Starner, that still it worries me a little bit. But other than that, everything's fine. Okay. And so see, he was even talking to there. He missed me ripping on him. That's no fun. No fun at all. I tell you what. Uh, I also want you to know that this church has a very special place in my heart and in my church's heart. Uh, back before you guys had joined together as New Beginnings, Dan Eddington came to me. I was on the church planning team at the time, and there were some things that were going on. He said, Chad, this is this situation that's going on, and we think some things may happen, and there may be something that comes together and something really cool and all that. And uh, So he was asking about So I literally drove. At that time, I was living in Mantino, uh, Illinois, which is a little bit of ways away from here. And so I drove over here. And I sat right out there in that parking lot and prayed for what might happen. And later on, people from our church came and we sat out here and we prayed. And every single time that I had something going on at the camp, we would stop by and we would pray and we would do that. Because uh, it was important to Dr. Dan, uh, it became important to us. And we just prayed that God would do a really cool thing. And then when Mike came and at one point was helping lead you guys through stuff as you were looking at merger. I'm like, how cool is that? Because I'm connected with Mike here. Mike's connected with that. It was so neat and so awesome to see what God has done. And now to get to be with you for a couple weeks, I just count as an incredible joy and privilege to get to do that. Streeter also holds a special spot in my heart because I've been here back and forth since I was a teenager doing stuff at camp and, and other things. I used to come to big Scholastic Bowl tournaments over here at uh, Streeter High School. Uh, in fact, one time I was challenged to, uh, uh, to change my name. You had to put your name on a little name card in front of where you sat when you would buzz in and class the bowl. Any of my fellow nerds out there understand what that's like. And, uh, and one time my, my coach was messing around with me and he goes, oh, you just ought to change up your name today. So I changed from Chad Ozy to Antonio Ose. Okay, that was my name that day. Not really politically correct to do that today, okay? But that's what I did. 
And uh, it turned out I was the MVP of the tournament, and so my mom still has a trophy at her house that says Streeter Tournament MVP Antonio Ose. So the one time I get an MVP trophy in my entire life, it doesn't even have my own name on it, which is uh, probably fitting for what I did. Uh, I love that. I still back here at Streeter all the time. I work as a, a sports official along with being a pastor, and I primarily work collegiate sports, both baseball and basketball. But I fill in on a few Friday nights uh, doing some high school basketball, and so I almost always get one of your big boys' uh, rivalry games with some of the local teams, and so that's always fun to come over once or twice a year and, uh, and do that. And uh, in fact, just this uh, early this season, the only college baseball games I got in before all the corona stuff happened, I was at Millican University, and uh, one of the young men that was, was there, I go, man, I know you. Like, where do I know you from? And he's looking at me, and he, he tried to figure out, was it a summer team he was on or whatever? All of a sudden, I'm like, you played for Streeter High School. Because uh, about three years ago, I worked one high school baseball game that year because they needed somebody to, pitch, to, to pinch hit at the last second. And I came in, and he was a shortstop for your high school team back then. And uh, how cool to, just to make some of those connections and all that kind of stuff. So all of that just to say I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and excited about what God's going to do. At my church, we are a church plant. Uh, Mike and Wendy get this. Uh, when you're a missionary on the field and you go someplace to speak, what you typically do is you wear the garb of wherever you're at because that's more interesting. So the people that were in more interesting places, you know, got bigger love offerings. That's kind of how it worked because it just looked cool or whatever. And uh, so I come to you wearing the clothing of my people today. Uh, this is what uh, we would wear. I did dress up a little bit. Instead of putting on tennis shoes, I put on something else just so I'd be a little classier for you all today coming over. Uh, from where we're at. But at my church, we're a church plant, so we're a very young church. So in the same way that you guys are young since your merger, even though there's history on both sides of that, we're a very young church as well. And uh, part of what we've been doing during this whole COVID, corona, whatever we want to call it thing, is uh, we've been walking through a series called What's Next? Because everybody looks at what's now, right? This is the really cruddy situation we're in now. But I want us to look towards what's next. And we've identified four key things in that that are, that are important. It's important to know God. It's important to find freedom. It's important to discover purpose. And it's important to make a difference. And so I'm going to bring some pieces of that to you guys these next two weeks, if that's okay, because I think that's important as you guys look at what's next. Not just the current situation, but what's next as you have a new pastor that leads you? Uh, what's next as everybody reemerges from everything that's gone on and, and stuff is just different? You know, some of us love coming back together today because it's what we used to do, right? I mean, let's just be honest. That's, we, we want to see people we haven't seen. We want to sit in pews we haven't sat in. We want to sing songs we haven't sung in the same way and, and all of that. But the reality is, is that nothing is what it was. Nothing. It's different today. And our world is different today because of what has gone on. And so if we are going to be the church that God has called us to be, we must be ready not for what was or not even what is, but what's next. So I'm going to be in the book of John today, John chapter 8. Now to kind of set this up a little bit for you, at the beginning of John chapter 8, we have the story of the woman who was caught in adultery. Uh, many of us know that story, but just in case you don't, let me give you just a, a little bit of info. There were some religious people that were trying to catch or trip up Jesus. Okay, that's essentially what they were doing. They were trying to catch him between a rock and a hard place. So they bring out this woman, they throw her down into the dust, and they say, look, she's been caught in the act of adultery. Now, for a woman at that time, there was no greater charge. There was no worse thing she could possibly do than be caught in the act of adultery. They bring her out, and they're like, what should we do? Well, the law at the time said that if she was caught in that act, she should be stoned to death. We think, well, wow, that's not a loving, gracious, wonderful God. It's, but this was, a, this was a time where we were operating specifically, directly under the law. That's what the law said they should do. And so as they were doing that, Jesus begins to, to communicate. He begins to share, and he says this. He says, the one who does not have sin in his life... Go right ahead, pick up the stone and throw it. Now, that's not a direct quote, okay? That's the Chad translation there, but that's what he says. He says, look, if, if you are without sin, 
go ahead and throw it. And one by one, these people begin to leave. Now, it's not just enough to say that Jesus kept this situation from happening. He also then steps in and he has this very short, very direct conversation with this woman where he says, look, don't go back to that life. Something different happened today. And from this point on, leave what you did and go to what's next. He then goes on after that and he begins teaching. He talks about what it means to be the light of the world. And a lot of us know that. And so he, he talks about this idea that not only is he the light of the world, but those that follow him are called to be the light of the world and to share that light with others. So he sets everything up for us as we get to this section of John chapter 8. First, we see him literally save someone from death. He explains that then he is the light of the world. He then tells them that he is as his father is. If you have seen him, you have seen the father. And after he does all of that, he says, oh, and by the way, I'm leaving. I've saved you. I'm the light of the world. Me and the Father are one, but I'm going to be gone. Okay, wait, the, the light is going to be gone? Well, no, and we learn more about that later. He brings another one along with us that is our comforter and guide and all of that. But for those who were experiencing this in the moment, you have to understand how many different emotions have to be going on within their life. They've seen this amazing thing happen. He's told them who he is, and now he's told them he's leaving. They don't fully understand that yet. And so we get down to John chapter 8, verse 30. This is what we see. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Now, we're going to kind of walk through this verse by verse, and sometimes I'll read and sometimes I'll stop, so you'll have to forgive me as I do that. But there is a big difference in believing him or believing about him and believing in him see if i believe someone it means i believe they're telling the truth right so if i have a friend of mine that says the chicago cubs are the best team that has ever played in mlb history i know he's not telling the truth i don't believe him I don't if you told me the White Sox, I would say that's not true either because I'm a Kansas City Royals fan. Okay, so that's just how it works, all right? So I wouldn't believe you. If you looked at me and you said, I am so thrilled to be back at church today, I'd say, I believe you. I see it on your faces. I hear it in the way you sing. I see it in the way you connect. I believe you. I believe that what you are saying is truth. Believing in someone, however, is different. Belief in someone says, I believe that this person is who they say they are and will do what they say they will do. Man, we see that laid out for us in very simple ways when children are little. Right, man, I have two kids. My daughter just graduated high school. Her name's Caitlin. My son is 17. He's a junior getting ready to be a, well, just finished a junior year, going to be a senior on the football team at Bradley next year. He's the starting center and big kid, bigger than me. Uh, intimidates me a little bit. Don't let him know that, all right? And uh, I got great kids. I remember when they were little and the family would go somewhere on vacation. You know, if you go somewhere on vacation, the only thing the kid cares about with the hotel is not how clean it is, not how good the breakfast is. What is it they want? They want a pool. That's right. That's the number one thing they want. They want a pool. So we would go swimming. My kids were little, and I, I used to be a water safety instructor, lifeguard, all that kind of good stuff. And so I was the kind of guy that would not let my kid wear water wings. I know it makes me a horrible father to some people, all right? I wouldn't let him do it because I saw it teach bad habits, and kids actually were more fearful, that kind of stuff, so I wouldn't let him do it. So we'd start them out in the shallow water, and they'd do whatever, and they'd play, and they'd have fun. And all. One day, I'm swimming down in the deep end, and my son comes running down. Son Caleb looks at me, Dad, I want to swim with you. All right, come on. Let's do it. And he kind of 
comes up to the edge, you know, that, that little concrete lip right there at the edge of the pool, and he kind of gets there, and <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, that's, de- like that's, that's deeper than I am tall, you know? That's kind of how he's thinking, because at that time, he's like this big. And finally, he takes about two steps back, and he takes a flying leap and lands right here on top of my head. I mean, literally right here. And as he lands here, my hands come up and I grab him and I keep his head above the water. My head did not stay above the water, but his did. Now what happened in that moment is my son displayed belief in me. I told him he would be safe. I told him he would be okay. I told him he would not drown. And so with this reckless abandon that only a four or five-year-old kid can have, he launches himself through the air towards me, and luckily I am able to verify his belief. See, when they say they believed in Jesus, what they were saying was is they no longer found their belief in the religious establishment. They no longer found their belief in this list of do's and don'ts. They no longer found their belief in government or in help of any way except Jesus. They believed in him. Jesus is who he says he is. He will do what he says he will do, and we believe in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now it's an interesting choice of words that Jesus uses here, because he talks about the word free in the original language. It's talking about total and complete freedom. In other words, not being under the constraints of someone else, but being free from outside rule. That's the kind of freedom that we're talking about here in the original language. And so they respond in a way that makes sense to the language that he used. They say, we are descendants of Abraham, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Now, remember the day and age they're living in, right? Okay, this is the Roman Empire. They are not technically enslaved to Rome, but they are ruled by Rome. And they don't like that. So what's happened here is Jesus has begun poking an exposed nerve. Right? They don't like the idea that they are, but but yet they are too proud to say that they are enslaved. They're not acting as slaves. They're still allowed to live their life and operate within the context of what's happening in the government around them. But what they say is, whoa, 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 hold up. We've never been enslaved to anyone. So if we're not enslaved to anyone, how can you say that we will become free? Because if we will become free, it insinuates that we are not currently free. So Jesus responds, verse 34, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you really will be free. Let's look at those. First of all, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. See, they were looking at it within the context of the socioeconomic, within the political system that was there at the time. Jesus says, look, I could care less about that. I care about the slavery of sin. Anyone, everyone who has committed sin is a slave to sin. Now, here's what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? All. All does not mean most. All does not mean many. I did not do really great in English in high school, but I did learn that the word all means all. I get that part. So if all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that means I have made choices in my life that have allowed me to follow down this road of slavery. Now, anytime somebody of my particular skin pigmentation uses the word slavery, it is a dangerous thing. Can we just be honest about that in the day and age that we live in? Right? 
because there are connotations of that word within our culture that in some ways we want to separate from the kind of slavery that God is talking about here, but in other ways are absolutely identical to the kind of slavery that we are talking about here. See, true and complete slavery means that I have no rule of my own. Some people use the word agency. Agency means I have the right to act as an agent on my own behalf. I can make decisions for myself. Someone who is a slave has zero agency. In our, in our country, there was a time when people of color had no agency. They could not make decisions for themselves. Someone who held a piece of paper that said they owned that person of color had their agency. They made decisions for them can't imagine what that was like. I have no idea in my life what that was like. Because I have never been at a point in my life where I did not have agency. Except for what Jesus says here. He says anyone who has committed sin has become a slave to sin. And so what happens is, is that when we are caught in the trap, in the grip of sin, we have lost agency in our life. All of a sudden, that sin controls us. And if you don't think that's true, go back with me to the kid story again, would you? Can we go back over here for a minute? You ever seen a little kid lie to their parents and the parent knows it's a lie? Now, some of you were kind parents. When you caught them in a lie, you would immediately reprimand them for that. You would teach them the error of their ways. I was not a kind parent. I would see just how far is he willing to go down that rabbit hole. Oh, really? Well, tell me more about that. Oh, sure. Well, what happened next? And what happens is, is that initial sin that my child made by choosing to lie rather than tell the truth caught them and enslaved them. And now if they were going to hang with that, they had to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. They were enslaved to sin. They had no agency in their life. So Jesus uses an example of a time where slavery was very active within the Roman Empire to people of all colors at that time uses that idea of slavery to help us understand just how severe the depths of sin are. They hold us enslaved. So he says this, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. Now what he's saying here is that a slave would be used for a time. A slave would be used for the length of their usefulness. I have a slave that works in my fields. They work in those fields and they're healthy and they help bring in my crop and they do whatever. And then all of a sudden they get to the point where they're injured. And now they're no longer able to work in my field. So guess what I could do as a slave owner? Sell them somebody else that might use them for a different purpose. I could do all of these different things. Why? Because they're not a part of my house. They're just a slave. But a son, a son's different. And my son can mess up royally. I was a son who messed up royally. Most of you guys that are in here were sons that messed up royally at some point in your life. Guess what? You're still part of the family, still part of the home. May have been difficult, may have been strained, but you were always belonging in that place. So Jesus says, look, all who have committed sin are enslaved to this sin. And a slave cannot find freedom, but a son remains in the house forever. Even, even though they're part of this structure, they are the descendant of the father. They are the one who will inherit everything the father has. So if the son chooses to set a slave free, guess what that slave is? 
no longer a slave. They're free. The Son has set them free. They find freedom from the Son. Therefore, if the Son sets you free, you really will be free. Now, let me take a quick parenthesis here if I can. Because I think this is really important. I think if we don't address our current cultural context, we are missing out. I did not grow up a person of color. I know you can see that, all right? Didn't happen. I grew up in a very middle class situation. Now, I didn't realize there were points in my life when I was a lot lower middle class than I realized. Like, I didn't realize when I was a little kid that everybody did not eat salmon cakes and spam and bologna six meals out of the week. I, I, I didn't know. I just thought that's what everybody did. You know, I didn't know there was this thing called Velveeta cheese. Like, I had friends of mine, I went over to their house and I got a grilled cheese sandwich made out of Velveeta cheese. Who doggy, why had nobody told me about that before then? That was good stuff. My family did not afford Velveeta cheese. We got like the Vel Ainta cheese or whatever it was, it was the off brand at the, at the store. That's what we got. Right? I want you to know, I never felt like I did without. I never felt like I was less fortunate or anything like that, but, but I still had a pretty privileged upbringing. I just did. I want you to know that our culture that we live in right now does everything it can to create divides. Everything it can. We are hearing right now about the idea of racial divide right? It is all on the media around us. If it, I want you to know, though, if it wasn't racial divide today, it would be something else. It would be political divide. I mean, we now have entered a culture where you can't be a Republican and a Democrat and be a friend. That's what we've told people, right? You can't, if, if you don't agree with me, you can't be my friend. I can't. Uh, we all know that the almighty thing that runs our world now is Facebook, all right? You cannot say my Facebook friend if you say things that are different than what I like. We find every sort of divide possible. I want you to know that we do not have a political problem in our country today. We don't. I don't care how divided it is. We don't have a law enforcement problem in our country today. We don't have a racial problem in our country today. We don't have a social injustice problem in our world today. We don't. We have a sin problem in our world today. What is going on today is not about all this other stuff. What this other stuff is, is the sin that we are enslaved to. Because we are enslaved to sin, it has demonstrated itself in all of these other ways. And we have become, as a culture, enslaved to sin. And sin is going to find its way out in every possible way imaginable. And so if Satan can use race as a way to divide, guess what he's going to do? If he can use incredible overreach by law enforcement to divide, guess what he's going to do? He's going to do it. If he can use political parties to divide, he's going to do it. I want you to understand today that people around you think they are different from you. I live, I don't know what, an hour to the east? It's not that far. If you were to ask people where I live, are people in Streeter, like people here? Some of them would say, where's Streeter? Right? They would. I mean, it's not like you're on the interstate where they just, you know, see you all the time, whatever. They go, oh, well, they're, they're different because of, I mean, we're in this kind of setting and there and that kind of setting. I'll tell you, I've spent lots of time in Streeter. I've spent more time in the Streeter Kroger than I would like to admit. I mean, we're talking like two hour long shopping trips every time I came in to do a camp for different stuff or whatever. I mean, it's crazy. There was, there was one week I had to go there like six times in one week. I mean, I have spent lots of time in the Streeter Kroger. Here's what I know about Streeter. Ain't nothing different in Streeter than there is where I'm at. Nothing. 
I mean, we may have a bigger hospital in town. We may have a few more gas stations. Ain't nothing different about the people where I'm at and people from Streeter. But we want to look at, we want to create all these divisions. We want to think that we are different because if we are different, it's easier for me to look at that group as those people rather than people. I'm going to look at people with a different skin color as those people rather than people. People of a different political party as those people rather than people. People that have more money than I have as those people rather than people. People that have less money than I have as those people rather than people. God says that he so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that people like me could find eternal life. I don't think that's what it says. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son so that whoever Democrat, Republican, Independent. Whoever, Cubs fans, White Sox fans, or God's chosen, the Royals fans. Whoever, black, white, yellow, brown, purple, I don't care. Whoever believes in him, not just believes about him, but believes in him, like we talked about, believes in him, would have eternal, everlasting, amazing, incredible, fulfilled life. What is the opposite of slavery? It is freedom that brings life. Slavery calls out for death. Because the only release from slavery is death. That's it. Freedom brings life. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Who the sun sets free is free forever. Who the sun sets free can find freedom not only from sin, but can find freedom from racial injustice. Can find freedom from political turmoil, can find freedom from socioeconomic despair because we know that our life, our hope, comes not from those things, but comes from Christ himself. So the question is, have you found freedom? Do you know freedom? Because freedom comes from believing in him. The second question that we have today is, if you have found freedom, are you sharing that freedom with others? I lived for a long time in southern Illinois. When I say southern Illinois, I mean close enough that I could hit both Tennessee and Kentucky with about a seven iron, okay? Kind of right there where everything comes together. An area that for a long, 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 long time was considered one of the most racist places in America. I did not grow up in an area like that. It was very, very foreign to me, very, very different. And began kind of learning and understanding and all that kind of stuff. And as I began digging in and doing some research, I found out some interesting things. In the areas that were most controlled by people who were the most racist. There were also some of the most amazing stories of people who would bridge that gap. I mean, we can look all the way back to to actual slavery in America. Where is it that the Underground Railroad had the most success? In places that were most controlled by slavery. We go to the house church in China, one of the most phenomenal stories of the last century of Christendom. When communism came in and they oppressively stopped the church from meeting, guess what happened to faith in China? It exploded. Because there were people that said, everyone else around me is being enslaved to this, but I know freedom. And I want other people to know the freedom that I have found. 
Here's what I believe is the true mark of someone who has found freedom. I don't care if we're talking what, whatever situation in life, someone who has found freedom, somebody that used to smoke all the time, right? And all of a sudden, they, they conquer that, right? With God's help, with other help, whatever, right? And now they're no longer a smoker. Are they not the single most annoying person to their smoker friends? Because they want their friends to stop smoking. And they got all sorts of reasons why. I mean, you'll save $12,000 a year. You'll be healthier. You'll be around to see your grandkids graduate someday. Whatever, right? Somebody that used to be enslaved to that, to that addiction, they now want to go to other people and say, look, you don't have to do that anymore. I have a friend of mine that was very, very addicted to pornography to the point that it almost controlled his life, cost him his family, all sorts of stuff. Guess what he does today? He goes around talking to people about the incredible dangers and trying to help people find freedom from that thing that is tearing apart families left and right in our culture today. He has been freed from that slavery. I want you to know that if we have found freedom from the slavery of sin, the mark of showing that freedom is helping other people find it. So if today, it's about us all coming back together and going, oh man, it's so good just to be in church and go back to things as normal. Then folks, we have missed out. The fact that God has allowed you in such an incredibly short period of time in the midst of a pandemic and everything else that's going along uh, on around us to have a pastor in place that knows your church and knows your community and has the ability to help lead you where you need to go. If it's just about going, oh my gosh, thank God we have a pastor again. And folks, we have missed the mark. But if this is about helping people find freedom, oh man, now we are on the right path. Because who the Son sets free is free indeed. Number one, have you found freedom? Number two, who are you helping find it? God, thank you today that we have the ability to follow you. God, when we come into a personal relationship with you, we talk about it as choosing to follow Jesus. God, can, can we just admit today that that has to be a daily choice, an hourly choice, sometimes a minute-by-minute minute choice? So God, I pray that collectively, we as followers of Jesus Christ today would choose to follow you, that we would choose to follow you in a personal relationship so that we might find freedom from sin. But the God that we then would choose to follow you, you came out of heaven. Your son came down and lived among us in difficulty and in turmoil so that others might find freedom. God, may we be willing to walk across the street, maybe into a situation that is difficult, maybe into a situation that is uncomfortable, but will we be able to do that so that we can help others find freedom? God, may it not be about us. May it not be about our comfort. May it not be about what's easy, but may it be about you and your kingdom. God, help us find freedom. I pray it today in Jesus' name. Amen.